In the writing tips segment this time, I wanted to talk about the transition of books to other forms, movie, TV, even podcast. More of that is going on now than probably ever before. It seems like there is an endless stream of not only movies, but new television shows on Netflix and Amazon Prime. And who, I mean, who can possibly keep up with it? Not me, and you'd be better off reading books anyway, but that's beside the point. The point is a lot of authors understandably would like to see their books adapted to other forms, either just because it sounds like fun or because they know that might raise the visibility of their book, lead to greater sales and greater renown and greater success. And and that's all understandable. That's one re- uh, Previously on this podcast, I interviewed Aaron Henneke, who is a very successful film scout for several major Hollywood studios. And in fact, she's going to be speaking and taking pitches Labor Day weekend at WriterCon in Oklahoma City, so you don't want to miss that opportunity. There's another option in town, something new called Tail Flick, T-A-L-E-F-L-I-C-K. That's a website platform that has been created, a submission platform to allow authors or anyone who holds the rights to a work to submit a story for consideration. Now, to be fair, you pay a fee for this. When I looked this morning, it was $88, and that's not chump change. But then again, that's a lot less money than you would end up paying an agent. Not only your book agent, but you'd probably, in most cases, need an additional subsidiary agent who knows the world of film and TV. So, if it works, this would be pretty beneficial. I haven't done it myself. Obviously, no one can make any guarantees, but it might be something worth looking at. According to George Berry, who created the platform, he says, quote, We use analytics, and we have a very large curation team who curate the content and find the best stories out of that, end quote. Basically, producers and other people who are looking for stories to adapt can go to Tail Flick and search by keyword, for the kind of stories they're looking for. Legal thrillers like The Last Chance Lawyer, which why isn't that a movie already? Or a romance, or perhaps even something more specific. Young adult, dystopian, science fiction, female protagonist, uh, whatever, you know. Uh, they can find it by searching for it on Tail Flick. I spent some time reading what Barry and other people who use the website are saying they're looking for. And time and time again, it brought me back to the first three core books in the Red Sneaker series. And I'm not just saying that to promote my own books. I'm saying that because it's true. Those are the fundamentals, not only for writing a good book, but writing a terrific film or television program, story structure, creating character, perfecting plot, I mean, those are the fundamentals. That structure that I teach in story structure is exactly what movie people are talking about when they talk about the three-act structure. Beginning, middle, end. Inciting incident. Progressive complications. The dark moment. Climax. The denouement. That's the same structure whether you're writing books or films. Creating character. Character is probably mentioned more often than any other single factor when TV and movie people start talking about what they're looking for. Something fresh, something engaging, someone that people can relate to. And then, of course, plot is always going to be important. Remember that film and TV are visual mediums, media, which mean there's got to be something to look at, right? There can be quieter moments introspective moments. It doesn't have to be all fistfights and shootouts, but something visual needs to be happening. And that comes down to plot and marrying plot to character so that you have character arc and growth and all the things that make for good storytelling. One other element that I detected when I read what people were saying they were looking for, people including at the recent London Book Fair, talking about what they're looking for in the movies and television, and that was 
timeliness, something that might make the product easier to sell, not only to the studio or platform like Netflix, but also something that might make it more appealing to people who might watch it. Timeliness. Like, for instance, the example that came up time and time again, The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood. Now, isn't that ironic? Because, of course, that book came out decades ago in the 80s, I believe. But it's coming back around today because, as a result of the Me Too movement, time's up. Uh, It seems timely. Stories about female oppression or female empowerment have a relevance that makes those projects more marketable. You can see that in the spins that are be given, being given to projects being launched today. Uh, my kids have been watching Sabrina the Teenage Witch, which of course goes back to a previous series and a previous comic book, but clearly is in the moment. On the one hand, it's a horror project, but at the same time, it's a very strong, central female character. Or in the movie theaters right now, Captain Marvel owns the box office. Well, that's a superhero story, which goes back 80 years to Superman or maybe thousands of years back to Hercules. But the point is, this time, it's a female heroine, and there is very much a female empowerment theme going throughout the movie. What you want even if it's not in terms of timeliness, is something that makes your project seem fresh, that makes your story seem fresh, something that isn't a complete retread of what has gone before, which is another concept I talk about in those books, of course, that editors, and it turns out also movie and TV people, are looking for the same but different. The same meaning a recognizable genre, Superhero story, horror story, romance, thriller, and yet there's something different. Maybe something timely, maybe a character who's not what you expect, but one way or another, something different. So, while I've been talking, I hope you've been thinking about the project you're writing or thinking about writing and thought, hmm, how can I give my story some of that, some of the same but different? What's different? What could I tweak? What could I change? Or how could I inject some moment of timeliness into this story? And if you can figure that out, your chances of actually selling this story to an editor or to somebody in the movie and TV industry just went up a thousandfold. My interview this time is with Danielle Norman, who, as I mentioned at the outset, is a children's book and women's fiction author. But what I asked her to talk about in this interview was her approach to writing, which is basically that she dictates all of her early drafts. She does it not only to save time, but because she believes it helped her find her authentic voice, which improved the quality of her writing. Here's what she had to say. Danielle, thanks for being on the podcast. I'm happy to be here. All right. If you could offer one piece of advice to somebody who wants to write, what would it be? Don't listen to anyone. (laughs) Wait, you've just negated the whole podcast. (laughs) Well, you have to think about it. If it's really, I always looked at writing as recipe cards. Mm -hmm. Um, when we all start writing, we all want to look at recipes on the, you know, think of a recipe. When we all start learning to cook, we go buy these recipes, we look at the box, we follow it exactly to a T. But then when we get comfortable, we start changing it. Right. We add a little of ourselves here and a little of ourselves here. You know, now when I make, you know, homemade baklava, because I'm Greek, I don't ever pull out a recipe and I don't make it the same way Yaya made it. I add my own flair. Remember, it's all about you. Nothing is cookie cutter. You have to add your own spice. Make everything you. Don't listen to anybody. You have to add your own stuff. Make it you. That's good advice. I'd like to talk about, uh, you have a unique approach to writing, kind of a pioneer, really, (laughs) in the world of dictation. Okay. Uh, 
How did that get started? Um, I'm a breast cancer survivor. Mm -hmm. um, and that's actually what turned me into writing. Um, I was a veterinarian and had just lost my career because I had lost a lot of lymph nodes and no longer could control the animals. And so I decided, my husband gave me 24 hours, a pity party. He said, in the next day, I want to know what you're going to do. Mm. And I said, I want to be a writer. And so I immediately started. And we started with dictating because as I sat at the keyboard, it hurt too bad. My mm. arms would hurt. And so I started dictating. And I realized some things just made sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, because I, no one ever grows up saying, oh, I want to be a story typist. They all say, I want to be a storyteller. Well, that's all verbal. I've read books before where I've, because when you read, you read out loud, even if it's in your mind, you still, you're speaking it in your mind mm -hmm. and you read books and you go, that doesn't sound right. And you keep rereading sentences over and over because they don't sound right. Whether people want to admit it or not, we are auditory people. Mm -hmm. We worry about how things sound. That's why from the time we're a child, we love picture books because it's that rhythm and so once I started learning that, I go, oh, this is why dictation works. Right. It's all about the voice. Mm -hmm. And so I started speaking my scenes, my chapters, and I would let it just type, you know, from my computer. I didn't watch what it was typing. I went back and edited it later. Of course. And um, mm -hmm. I did the math. If you're really well organized, you can type, like if you know what you're going to do, you can type a chapter um, or type about 500 to 1,000 words in 30 minutes because you're analyzing so much. Mm -hmm. When you just let it go and start talking, it's about 3,000 words in 30 minutes. That's incredible. I, I told you beforehand that uh, back in my lawyer days, of course, this was 80s and 90s, uh, pre-word processors on everybody's desk. Right. Uh, I dictated work all the time. And of course, it was very efficient uh, and the best we had technologically at that time. But I, I don't think the thought of dictating a book, a novel, has even occurred to me. Mm -hmm. And yet you've made it work. I have. Um, and how many times do ideas come to you in the spare of the moment? Mm -hmm. And so I just, when they come to me, I just turn on my little, whether it be talk to text I mean, how many of us, you know, send our text messages by talk to text? Right. Me. Exactly. That's what it is. It's talk to text. And that's what we're doing with our stories. Um, every computer now, whether it be a PC or a Mac, they are they are fueled. Their whole um, dictation program is done by Dragon. That's mm -hmm. the word. Um, I'm a Mac user. And the, um, you press function, function twice on your Mac. And when you do, it'll bring up your microphone. Right. Um, I will tell you, I have learned, don't watch it. Black your screen, turn around, whatever, <laughs> and just turn it on to record. Let it go. Talk. Mm -hmm. Don't watch the words appear on the screen. Right. Per se. And I mean, if you're having to think about what you're going to say and so you're quiet for a few minutes, who cares? What's it going to do? Record nothing? I mean, what's it? Who? Don't worry about it. It takes time. I just start talking out my scene, talking out the chapter, going through it. When I'm done, I'll then stop and then I look at it and go through and tighten it. And when I'm done, I end up with a polished chapter. So usually from eight to nine, I dictate my chapter. And then from, you know, nine to usually 11 or so, I go through and I tighten it. I add all the punctuation because I don't worry about learning all the punctuation. I know some of them. I don't worry about the rest. And Usually by, you know, 11 o'clock, I have a perfectly polished 3,000-word chapter. Now, just to be clear, we're talking about creating a first draft, right? Well, after I finished editing, it's it's more than a rough, it's not a rough draft any longer. Editing on the computer, you mean? Yeah, um, I um, speak um, for an hour on a chapter, and it's usually about 6,000 words. Mm -hmm. And then that's usually about 8 to 9 o'clock in the morning. And then from 9 to 11, I usually go back through it, cut out the things that maybe sound redundant, go through, polish it. So it sounds almost like a just perfect draft. And that's usually what my editor is going to see is that version. You know what a lot of people are going to say or think. They're going to say, well, 